Mike Hackworth has shown throughout his career the ability to revolutionize industries. From electronics to two-way cable television to digital marketing, some even years before they would become household words. As co-founder and CEO of Cirrus Logic, he has helped lead the Cirrus Logic team to over 70 industry-first product innovations, making him an undisputed pioneer of fabless semiconductor technology. Mike spent his first memorable years growing up on a farm in Kansas, then returned to his native California, where early on he showed a natural tendency to be both self-sufficient and innovative. A career in technology, however, wasn't his first choice. His original plan was to become either a priest or civil engineer, but all that changed when he got a job sweeping floors at Ultronics sparking an interest that would become a lifelong passion, electronics. Well, actually, the start of my career was uh, an accident. Uh, I'd sprained my ankle one track season, and I said, well, rather than just sit it out, I might as well get a job. And uh, went to the what was then called the unemployment department. And they said, well, you're number 12 on the list, but since you want to be an engineer, we'll move you to number one because the company that was hiring wanted somebody who wanted to be an engineer when they went to college. And uh, so it was all a set of accidents. But it was an electronics company, and I ended up uh, working there for probably 10 years. Staying with the company post-graduation, Mike had the distinction of being the only person from Silicon Valley to have his initials on the moon. No, he wasn't exactly pals with Neil Armstrong. Rather, Mike designed and supervised the manufacture of a precision data converter component used on the five successful lunar surveyors launched from 1966 to 1968, leaving his mark on a bit of lunar history. Ultimately becoming a marketing and applications manager for Ultronics, Mike joined the semiconductor industry in 1967 as a field sales account manager with Motorola in San Carlos, California, helping the falling company to become Hewlett Packard's number one supplier. By 1970, he had taken a step forward in the industry, installing the first two-way cable television amplifiers in the United States while working at Fairchild. Leaping at the opportunity to explore TTL logic, he joined Philips Semiconductor, then called Signetics, as a VP of Worldwide Sales. He also helped develop the industry's first logic cell library. Initially, I was uh, heading up the bipolar marketing area there, and that's where we uh, rolled out the industry's first uh, logic cell library. It was actually a custom program that our uh, logic designers did for Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, we knew it was pretty important, but we had no idea it would be the only way chips would be designed going forward. And uh, it was a fun, exciting thing, no question. Uh, then later on, of course, I was a group executive at uh, Signetics Phillips, and uh, I had a turnaround in the analog division and a, a restart in the two MOS divisions. So uh, daunting challenges, to say the least, but a lot of fun. And we were successful. Uh, that was the best part of it. Mike says he was too naive to say no when he was asked to take over the MOS microprocessor, MOS memory, and bipolar analog divisions of the company back in the 70s. Good thing, for it is his turnaround of the company's profits from $70 million to $750 million that led to the offer to join Suhas Patil in the development of a fabulous semiconductor company, a company known today as Cirrus Logic. The biggest challenge of being one of the first fabulous companies is that you're absolutely going against the grain, going against the conventional wisdom. So people would, would either ridicule what we were doing or would very carefully articulate it. It just couldn't be done, it wouldn't be possible. And uh, you just had to have the courage of your conviction and believe in the team and the people of what you were doing to, to uh, tough it through all of that, to start developing traction and momentum and success. And then, of course, everybody turns around and points to uh, what a great idea it is and how uh, terrific it was. But uh, the first few years there uh, were really tough. By the time Cirrus Logic completed its initial public offering, 
Mike also completed the year of his engagement to his wife, Joan, and his status as a Silicon Valley pioneer was set in stone. Mike is one of those uh, visionary people who will take uh, great risks to, uh, to achieve great rewards. Um, he is an out-of-the-box thinker. He uh, is not traditional in any way, and uh, especially, as, as people know with, with serious logic, he, um, he basically drove the, the fabulous industry to what it is today, uh, created a, a, an example of what you could do as a fabulous company. And uh, obviously that, that developed into a, an entire industry in its own right. A Silicon Valley Fast 50 company, one of the fastest companies in the fabulous industry to reach $1 billion in annual sales, Cirrus Logic has gone from the seed of a modern concept to a major supplier of advanced integrated circuits. The bar kept uh, being moved from Mike Hackworth. Uh, first it was, you really can't uh, build a company over $100 million on the, based on the fabulous business model, so Mike beat it. And then $250 million, and Mike beat it. And then $500 million. And no one believed that you could build a billion dollar company based on the fabulous business model. And uh, Mike proved them all wrong, and now there are several people sitting in the audience today that are billion dollar companies and that groundwork to build a billion dollar company on the fabulous business model was done by Mike Hackworth. Mike himself has gone from a student with a burgeoning interest in engineering to a man respected throughout the industry. He has received honors ranging from Semiconductor Entrepreneur of the Year to an honorary degree of Doctor of Public Service at Santa Clara University where he and his wife Joan were both awarded honorary doctorates of community service at the 2000 graduation commencement. Well respected in his field, Mike Hackworth is also well respected as a man who gives back to his community. His continuing passion for technology has led to his generous support of the Tech Museum of Innovation, of which he serves on the board of directors, and where the Hackworth IMAX Theater bears his name. Well, the Tech Museum's Hackworth IMAX Dome Theater was named in honor of the first significant seven-figure gift given to the building of the Tech Museum uh, by, by Mike and Joan Hackworth. And uh, when you're trying to start something as big as this, you need a leader. And you really need a leader of leaders because you're going to turn to other people and ask for their support, but somebody has to step forward first. And Mike and Joan were willing to do that. And so we were very pleased to name the theater uh, the Hackworth IMAX Dome Theater. Well, it's been wonderful to watch Mike uh, evolve, if you will, from his business career into more community-minded civic activities. And I think what that all means in the totality of it is he's a fantastic role model uh, for young people. Uh, I think uh, his involvement at the tech, for example, stands uh, as a great example of that as the tech invites in young people and helps develop them. And I think if they look at the career of Mike and how he's used and applied his talents, uh, they'd have to be motivated and want to follow in those footsteps. Well, I'm theoretically retired right now, so the future uh, uh, doesn't have me uh, uh, in the CEO, in the chief operating role, but I sort of can't leave the business alone. So uh, while I'm serving on a number of boards, both public and private, uh, and investing in some of the private companies, uh, I'm also coaching a lot of startups and sharing the scars that I develop on my back uh, with them, and it's just a lot of fun. Uh, they leverage off of my experience, and I'm learning from them. And uh, I believe in you either learn or die, and, and so I'm aggressively out there learning. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 2001 recipient of the Dr. Morris Chang Exemplary Leadership Award, Mike Ackworth.
I am, I am really humbled and extremely proud at the same time uh, to receive this award. That was really something. I absolutely have to have a copy of those films to show to my daughters and say, see, your dad was okay after all. You know, this award means a great deal to me personally. And I say that because, as was uh, reflected in the film there, back in 1985, I traveled the road less traveled, as they say, when I committed uh, to uh, build a company based on the fabulous model. And as it said in the film there, I went straight against the grain of an institution which pretty much took the position, in those days anyway, that real men had fabs. I used to say real men had something else, but uh, didn't get in the print. Anyway, I recall how the good old boys truly questioned, and this is really true, how I could possibly call Cirrus Logic a semiconductor company without owning a fab. And now I look back in this in retrospect, and I have to say it's amazing, but the fabulous model is well recognized and at least partially embraced by every, virtually every semiconductor company in the world. So it's really wonderful to me, having gone through all of that, to be recognized here tonight by the Fabulous Semiconductor Association, which I view as a group of peers that I deeply admire and respect. And my hat's off to all of you for all of your accomplishments as a semiconductor fabulous company. But I accept this reward tonight, not for myself, but for the Cirrus Logic team that I had the privilege to lead, pioneering this fabulous model. And I want to, for a moment, acknowledge the founder, my partner, Sue Haas Patil, as well as George Alexi, Kenyon May. It was these three gentlemen who led the creation of the enormous product value that enabled Cirrus Logic to be the fastest company to a billion dollars in the mid-90s. But I have to say, it was our manufacturing team that took on this enormous challenge of sourcing wafers for a billion dollars in revenue just as the foundry industry was getting started. They were the ones. They did the impossible. And I want to personally salute Michael Canning, who joined up with us when we had this crazy idea in the spring of 85 as VP of Manufacturing and took on the challenge of making this new paradigm work. He, together with his initial team, Senareddy, Yusuf Pala, Roger Smith, Arjan Vashani, all played key roles in blazing the trail. And of course, there are many others that I would like to mention if time permitted, but suffice it to say that this award is as much theirs as it is mine. I couldn't have done it without them. And as chairman of Cirrus Logic's board, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the great job my successor, Dave French, has done to focus the company now on entertainment electronics. So I've really been very fortunate to have been surrounded by some ex exceptional talent, not only from the startup, but also through the handoff of the new CEO of Cirrus Logic. And so I say congratulations to all of us. Now, just a comment here, and it's a short one, but I believe the trend toward fabulous model now is immutable, and that's probably an, an obvious statement. And the drivers for this are really the capital equipment costs and the process development costs that are spiraling upward as we enter the nano era. The invisible hand of capitalism, as I guess Alfred Smith would say, is forcing supply chain efficiency. And I would have to say this is not new. The semiconductor industry has been fracturing from its inception. And for the 30s and 40s something in the audience here, it'll probably amuse you to know that in the beginning, chip companies did everything. From crystal pulling, the silicon ingots, 
to making their own furnaces, to making their own test equipment, to fabbing the product and shipping it. And first, crystal pulling uh, became an outsourced business, probably in the 60s, late 50s maybe even. Then wafer fabrication equipment started to be outsourced in the 60s and early 70s, and out of that grew the semiconductor equipment industry. Test equipment was then migrated out in the 70s. And then the outsourcing of assembly and tests began in the 80s and became mainstream. And now over the last decade, the outsourcing of wafer fabrication. So that says, suggests the question, what's next? Well, I'm not sure on that, but uh, we do see some interesting companies and actions going on. For example, there's a company, eSilicon, which is promising a new model where the entire supply chain is outsourced. We see Intel promising to be a source of sophisticated libraries and to be an outsourced agent for the implementation of design and supply of chips, pretty much similar, I guess, to the eSilicon model. So the march towards specialization continues as the scale of the industry grows. And I see no let up in the relentless march of technology to drive that growth. But you might ask as you're sitting there, saying, Mike, aren't you being a bit too optimistic given today's economy? And I'm reminded of something an old Armenian friend of mine said years and years ago, told me it was an Armenian expression. He said, Mike, it's always darkest before the dawn. Well, nothing could be truer today, and nothing is more certain than the onset of dawn. So I thank you for this great recognition, and let's go forward with confidence and excitement into the new day. Thank you very much.